Welcome everyone and thank you for uh, joining this Best Climate Practice Award webinar dedicated to the best project that participated uh, uh, to this year's Best Climate Practice Contest uh, on the theme of local resilience and disaster risk reduction. I'm Aurora D'Aprile, a researcher at the ICCG and coordinator of the Best Climate Practice uh, Observatory. Uh, today we are going to discuss the key topics uh, of climate resilience uh, and uh, disaster risk reduction with a rich panel of experts uh, and project developers, uh, trying to understand better also how these topics fit uh, into the ongoing discussion of the COP23, the International Climate Talks, uh, uh, which started on Monday in Bonn, uh, and how bottom-up ideas and initiatives uh, are supporting uh, uh, communities across the world to better prepare and face risk uh, and impacts uh, from climate change. Before introducing the distinguished guest uh, of today's event, uh, just some, some quick instruction for the attendees who are following the panel and would like to ask questions to the speakers. Uh, the question and answer time will be at the end of the panel and uh, you can send us a question by using the GoToWebinar chat. Uh, if you want to ask uh, your question to a specific panelist, uh, please indicate it in your question. Uh, we'll make our, our best to report all the questions received, uh, but for time management uh, reason, we cannot guarantee that uh, there will be room for everyone. So please don't wait the very last minute to send your question via the GoToWebinar chat. But uh, um, without spending any further time, I'm very pleased and proud to present the speakers of today's event, uh, <clears throat> which is a truly uh, a transnational online roundtable encompassing several countries and time zones. Uh, so good afternoon to Dionisio Perez Blanco, Disaster Risk Reduction Specialist at the Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change and the and, and Enrico Mattei Foundation, joining us from Madrid and to Elisa Cagliari, a researcher at CMCC and FIM, in line with us from COP23 in Bonn. Uh, good evening to Freis and Gil, director and founder of uh, Liar Tech Software Labs from the Philippines. Uh, we, um, we are waiting to, to see if, uh, okay, we have also Elizabeth English uh, from Canada, uh, so uh, that, that uh, she's currently experiencing some uh, uh, connection disturbance, but uh, uh, she is here uh, in line with us from Waterloo, um, Canada. Uh, Elizabeth English, English is an uh, associate professor at the University of Waterloo School of Architecture in Canada and director of the Buoyant Foundation project. And uh, good afternoon as well uh, to Ashwer Kale, researcher and coordinator of the Water Stewardship Project at uh, Watershed Organization Trust uh, in India. Uh, thank you very, very much uh, to all of you for being with us today and exploring challenges uh, and strategies for climate resilience and disaster risk reduction. Now, uh, I leave the floor to Dionisio Perez Blanco from Madrid, who will introduce us uh, uh, to the concept of exposure, vulnerability and resilience uh, to natural disaster and uh, how climate change is affecting those factors. So, uh, thank you, Dionisio, for being uh, with us, uh, and please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rara, very much for the nice introduction, and thanks to all of you for joining the, this, what, what I hope will be a very interesting webinar. Um, so, yeah, uh, I'm going to make a small introduction or brief introduction on what the concept of resilience is, which is the, the concept on which this webinar is focused. Um, so I guess that to start with all this discussion that we're going to have next, uh, someone has to make the definition, so try to set a framework, which obviously can be challenged because this is very flexible, as we all know. I will try to provide a general overview of what we, re we are referring to from the economics standpoint. I'm an economist. Uh, when we talk about resilience, um, I will try to, to create, a, to, to provide, let's say, a comprehensive uh, definition of the topic that can be um, Use for the rest of this of the of the of the webinar and maybe also discuss a little bit because it's a very um, hot topic right now and it's many many things and many concepts are being challenged right now and this is proved by the many defin definitions that you can find in the literature that uh, try to explain what resiliency what what, re what resilience is uh, I have found many and there are many more probably but just 
I will try to stick to those that are provided by the most relevant institutions, World Bank, United Nations, in the yoga framework, so on and so forth. So let's say that when we talk, when we try to understand what's economic resilience and we try to um, provide a definition, usually we uh, talk about uh, the ability of a system to maintain function uh, when, when it's solved by an event. That's what we usually um, understand as economic resilience. This is just one part. Um, this, is, this refers basically to the static economic resilience, but we know that there is another type of resilience uh, which relates to the later efficient utilization of available resources on the repair and reconstruction to speed the system's recovery following a shock. So basically we have two types of uh, resilience. The first one is the ability of the system to resist a shock and the second one is the ability of the system to recover from that shock. Um, these are the concepts that we usually refer to as a static economic resiliency, the ability to withstand the shock, and dynamic economic resiliency, which will be the ability to recover from, from that shock. So from a business perspective, an economic perspective, the static resilience makes the best possible use of available resources um, to reduce the business interruption um, and the losses that stem from this business interruption at a given moment of time, in time. While the dynamic resilience works after the event, so you may have a flood, after doing the flood you may have some losses, asset losses, also life losses, and following the flood you try to achieve a new normal. Uh, the, the losses that happen during the process in which you are trying to get to the new normal are the dynamic, the dynamic resilience. Also, some recent studies, and I think this is very, very interesting, uh, talk about a third category of resilience, which refers to the capacity of the system to reduce vulnerability and to limit economic impacts during and after the event. So that would be a more proactive type of approach. Uh, but this is sometimes considered to fall in the mitigation sphere. In any case, I don't want to be very precise on that because obviously mitigation and resilience are very much connected. So if you're able to mitigate the impact, uh, you're going to be much more resilient, obviously. Um, also, you have other alternative classification that maybe you have heard in which we distinguish between the direct and indirect uh, uh, type of resilience. So basically the direct impacts of the events, of, the, of, of any catastrophic event uh, in terms of lives or asset losses, um, will refer to the direct uh, resilience, while the indirect resilience will be related to the ability of the economy to uh, recover and reconstruct and therefore to minimize the aggregate consumption losses following the, the, the impact. So, as you can see, it's a complex framework that we are dealing with. We have many different definitions, but in the end, we can distinguish between the ability of the, of the system to resist the shock initially, and then the ability of the system to recover following, following the shock. Um, obviously, economic resilience, uh, here we're talking about economic resilience, is there are many other types of resilience, for example, engineering resilience. But economic resilience differs from, this, from these other forms of, of resilience through its focus on property damage, which takes place at a specific point in time and then continues until the economy has recovered. So initially you have a shock, and then that's, a, that's the, the initial asset loss, life loss, whatever, and then you start to recover from that point onwards, and then you have a, a, a losses as compared to the normal that you will have had without suffering the, the, this, this impact. Obviously, any new normal state that you want to achieve following this, um, this impact, uh, this disaster or catastrophe, will be complicated or affected uh, by individual behavioral considerations. So, whatever the decisions that agents take following the shock are going to affect the dynamic resilience and are going to condition the dynamic resilience of the system. This is not something that you can, I mean, this is something that you can nurture. This is something that you can treat and you can try to enhance. So obviously the ability of the system to recover also depends on the policies that are implemented by, by the government but in order to recover following the shock. So that, that's, this is for me the most important part because it's, it conveys the message that resilience is a dynamic thing that can be affected by the policies that are implemented, not only engineering policies, the construction of new dam, new reservoirs to protect ourselves from, from a flood, for example, but also the policies that follow, also economic policies that follow the, the disaster. So you can recover following the disaster if you uptake a series of policies that enhance your resilience following the event and therefore allow you to recover faster. So um, 
This is why the United Nations defines resilience as a policy-induced ability, which to me is the most important topic that, we, that is going to be discussed today in the following presentations. It depends on us, it depends on the policies that we adopt, the fact that we are more or less resilient. So critically, the ability to be resilient can be nurtured, can be fed by the policies that we decide to, to take. And this explains a number of inherently vulnerable regions have attained why a number of regions that are, would be more vulnerable to, this, to, to some type of events uh, have nonetheless attained relatively high levels of development. Okay, through enhanced resiliency. So even if you are initially in a, in a position in which you are very much exposed to a risk, vulnerable, you can enhance your resilience through a series of successful policies. So that's important. I mean, it doesn't mean that because only because you are more, more exposed or vulnerable, you are less resilient. There are many other things and that, have, that can affect resilience and are conditioned by the policy, by the policy choice. So, um, I'm not going to take um, more, much more time because I had a presentation of five minutes, I already have taken six, but I would like to, to extend a little bit this idea of the policy-induced resilience. Um, basically, I will, I will try to provide a, a figure that can give you an idea of the potential that resilience has to, to, to increase or to enhance the welfare of the society. Right now, if we only take into account the long-term economic losses from disaster, uh, from natural disasters on average, that would give us a figure of slightly above $300 billion per year, US dollars per year, um, on average. Okay? Um, so based on a consideration of the impacts on man-made capital alone, so the impact that you will have, the direct impact that you will have during the event, and ignoring those that happen after the event and other environmental damages that may happen as well, we will be experiencing losses of $300 billion per year on average. These are data from the United Nations. So if you are able to nurture this ability to be more resilient, you could be, obviously you cannot reduce all these figures because there will be always some marginal, uh, some marginal damage that can be suffered. But if you are able, if you are successful in, the, in policy development, Let's say that you could be uh, reducing this damage considerably. And this amount of money, just to give you an idea, if we consider this damage, we aggregate all this damage and we put it in a ranking, uh, it will be the 36th, uh, the, the 36th economy worldwide in terms of GDP. So it's a very, a very large loss. And we are only considering the indirect impacts. If we consider the, the indirect impacts, so the dynamic resilience is also put into the equation. Uh, this, this, these damages could be much, much higher. So, I just wanted to, to start the discussion by highlighting how important it is to have um, a good policy uh, towards resiliency. Uh, I think this is not easy. Uh, there is obviously many, many uh, political issues that need to be discussed, and Elisa is going to, be, to do a much better work than me on that. But, I mean, in the yoga framework for action, all this was highlighted and they also, there was also some discussion on the ability to, or the, or the possibility to enhance resilience through the adoption of ex-ante policies. So policies that are taken before the disaster hits the economy and therefore uh, increase, increase the level of preparedness of the economy and make the economy more resilient to, against this, this, this type of risk. And to me that's the, the, most important, the most important thing that we can do right now. So instead of waiting for the disaster to hit and react exposed, um, we need to, to start to, to review the way we approach to this, to this risk. We need to, to, to acknowledge that these risks are going to happen, disasters are going to happen, and we need to be more proactive because this action is going to allow us to be much more efficient in terms of resilience. So thank you very much. I took uh, like eight minutes, sorry for that, Aurora. Um, I, I hope that this set the, the framework for the discussion, and I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to hearing what the other speakers have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diony, for this uh, very interesting, uh, extensive uh, introduction and for having stressed uh, the very important aspect of uh, good policies for, for preparing uh, and enhance resilience uh, for uh, local communities. Uh, now we are going to look uh, at uh, how the global community and the international organization uh, are dealing with the challenge of uh, reducing the risk uh, of climate disaster. So we go to Bonn at COP23 
uh, where uh, Elisa Cagliari is following the negotiation uh, with a peculiar focus on adaptation and uh, international efforts to reduce damages from climate change. Uh, so, hello Elisa, thank you for being with us today uh, to, fi to find, uh, to having found some time to, um, to share uh, what's going on uh, in Bonn uh, with us. So, the talks are just started and uh, will last until the end of next week. Um, so, uh, how the conference is dealing with uh, these themes, these topics, uh, and uh, what can we expect uh, from this front? So, hi, Aurora. Thank you so much for this opportunity to be part in the planet, in the planet, in the panel. I hope you can hear me fine. Here is pretty busy. There are almost, I would say, at least 10,000 participants at this conference, and the same number is expected to come. Um, well, what can we expect from COP23? Uh, as you might know, COP23 is a COP of transition, let's say, uh, because not that there are not big deadlines that are, are to be met here in Bonn this year uh, in terms of the operationalization of the Paris Agreement. Uh, but still, uh, the success of this uh, event will be judged on the basis on how much progress we can take home uh, with respect to the deadlines uh, for 2018. And what are they? Uh, the main deadline is the development of the so-called uh, rule book of the Paris Agreement, so the set of guidelines that will make the, uh, the agreement up and running. So this is the main thing that negotiators are discussing about uh, in this week, during this week of technical negotiations. Then from next week on, we will have the political, the, yeah, the political dimension uh, taking center stage, uh, and the what, and basically what have been discussed during this first week of technical negotiation will be certified, let's say, uh, by the ministries. Um, but. COP23 is not just important in terms of the uh, operationalization of the Paris Agreement, but also because it's putting resilience uh, at the center, let's say, uh, of this event. As you may know, the presidency this year uh, was given to Fiji. This is the first time in the history of COP that the presidency is uh, held by a small island developing states. And since uh, the beginning, I would say, since when uh, the Fiji presidency is put forward its vision to COP23 in May, but also um, during the opening uh, event uh, last Monday, uh, the president made very clear that this will be a COP uh, where, uh, resi where building resilience will be given center stage, uh, where uh, climate action in this sense will be highlighted. And in terms of, let's say, thematic priorities, uh, of course, uh, it's about building the resilience of the most vulnerable society, so small island states, uh, uh, other vulnerable countries, for example, African countries, uh, make um, some tools to build resilience accessible to them, for example, uh, insurance as a way to cope with the cost of uh, climate-related disasters, but also as a way to reduce them. So also looking into new kinds of innovative uh, insurance schemes to uh, not just to manage disaster, but also to reduce them. Uh, and also issues of uh, sustainable and resilient agricultural, agriculture are discussed, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, of course, uh, a lot of attention is also placed in uh, trying to um, reduce the problem from its root causes, let's say. So um, the, the focus on mitigation is really strong, so the, the COP presidency is have uh, stressed the importance of keeping the global temperature increase uh, below 1.5. Maybe some of you recall the slogan in Paris in 2015, which was put forward by a small island state, which was uh, 1.5 to stay alive. And um, if I, I don't know if you have heard that to this year the COP is structured in a slightly different way from what we are used to. Typically, we have a, a big space where both negotiations and um, showcasing of uh, climate actions uh, are held together, but this year it's a bit different because uh, these two zones of climate action and formal negotiations are 
uh, divided. And I'm actually uh, now talking from the one where uh, different experience from civil society, um, knowledge centers, uh, also different level of governments from municipalities to regions are showcased. And the, the president of the COP actually said that he's going to spend uh, uh, much more time in this place because he really stressed, he really put a lot of emphasis on the need to accelerate climate uh, action for the most vulnerable. And, and this really, uh, I would like to conclude my intervention by, um, by thanking, uh, well, first of all, Aurora for letting me be a jury of the, the context next year and for providing me with the opportunity to review your, your projects and to be inspired by them. Uh, all of them would fit perfectly here in the Climate Action Zone at Bonn. And it was really a pleasure for me uh, to, to take part in this whole process of the best climate practices. And I would like to wish you all the best for your projects. And I think that, I, yeah, my time is over. So if you have any other curiosities on what's happening here at COP, I'd be happy to answer to you in the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Elisa. Thank you for uh, reporting uh, from uh, COP23 and uh, thank you for sharing with us uh, <clears throat> uh, the adaptation and uh, disaster risk reduction front line uh, on the side of international negotiation. Uh, so we know that disaster risk reduction is uh, uh, increasingly under the radar uh, of um, international organization. Um, but climate change is also increasing the frequency and the intensity of extreme weather events and uh, climate-induced um, impacts such as uh, uh, floods, storms and heat waves. So concrete strategies and action to cope with climate-related disasters at the local le level are urgently needed. Uh, for this reason, uh, the Best Climate Practice Observatory this year dedicated the edition uh, of the Best Climate Practice Award to the team of building resilience uh, uh, to climate disaster risk. Uh, just for uh, the who don't know us uh, very much, the Best Climate Practice Observatory is one of the three ICCG observatories, the one focusing on uh, innovative ideas and bottom-up uh, initiative to tackle climate change causes and impact. Uh, in 2017, uh, the Best Climate Practice Contest uh, reached its uh, fifth ed edition uh, after the experience of, uh, climate finance, uh, of the Climate Finance Awards uh, uh, last year, the 2015 contest on climate change and water availability for uh, food production, uh, and uh, the um, uh, the 2014 edition on energy poverty, poverty alleviation and the first edition on urban resilience. Uh, this year, the aim was to actually showcase and promote uh, actionable ideas and concrete pro projects designed to support uh, urban and rural commun communities uh, in preparing and responding to climate disaster, uh, improve local resilience uh, and preparedness and recovery capacity. Uh, this year, we have received an impressive number of uh, valuable proposals. Uh, we received uh, over 200 of project proposals, uh, out of which uh, 19 shortlisted candidates were selected for the evaluation process. Uh, this uh, evaluation uh, is carried out through, was carried out through online voting polls on the Best Climate Practice um, uh, platform and uh, the assessment uh, of the international jury composed from, uh, by uh, six high-profile experts from uh, international universities and organizations. Here you can see a quick uh, overview of uh, the main information about this year edition of the contest. Um, as you can see from this map, uh, the shortlisted candidates came from a wide range of countries and areas uh, with an interesting majority uh, coming from uh, uh, de uh, developed or implemented in Southeast Asian countries. Uh, as we see also in this uh, uh, overview graph, the main risk that most of the project proposals try to address uh, are extreme weather events, of course, uh, but closely followed uh, by floods. Uh, 
the most uh, poor sweat goal is uh, definitely uh, disaster preparedness capacity with few project, ad project addressing uh, enhanced recovery. Uh, the area involved uh, almost equally split uh, between uh, urban and agriculture, highlighting uh, also the different conditions in which uh, disaster risk need needs to be managed. Uh, since uh, uh, the best climate practice uh, world focus, uh, focuses on innovative ideas and initiatives, it is not a surprise uh, that most of the proposal include new technologies uh, and uh, information and communication systems as tools to advance uh, uh, local resilience. Uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, today we don't have time to explore all the remarkable projects that have participated in the best climate practice contest, but uh, I suggest to anyone who is curious about it to take a quick journey on uh, the bestclimatepractice.org platform uh, where you can find detailed description and uh, information <laughs> about all the projects. <laughs> Uh, today, uh, I'm very glad to host uh, uh, the three projects uh, project that have achieved uh, su successful results uh, at the end of the best climate practice competition. <coughs> uh, the winner of this edition uh, is uh, the project Barangay Legatspi, a cloud-based information system to help communities in Philippines <coughs> prepare for natural calamities, reducing exposure and vulnerability to disaster risk. The jury also assigned two special mention <coughs> to the project Amphibious Housing and to the project Water Stewardship. And uh, we are here connected with uh, all the three project developers uh, to talk more about uh, <coughs> these three int very interesting projects. So uh, let's start from the winner of this year awards, uh, the project Balangili Gatsby that has been developed by uh, the Liar Tech Software Labs, uh, a young software uh, agency operating in the Philippines uh, and uh, directed uh, by Frey Sanjil. Okay. Uh, in, uh, so Frey Sanjil, uh, yeah, you are here with us. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for being connected to this uh, webinar. And uh, in this short video that we are going to see immediately, um, you explain the main goal and feature of uh, the project Balangay Legatsby. After this video, you are going to add further details to the project uh, explanation. So, let's launch. So, there. So, we conducted a uh, pre- and post-intervention assessments uh, in the pilot phase so that we can quantitatively and qualitatively measure the effects of introducing this new system to the vulnerable communities. So in this assessment, we uh, assess user preferences, you know, language, accessibility, the device specifications, etc. And uh, one thing is uh, we also gave them a quiz, like uh, we tested their knowledge on a different on common disaster related terms like tsunami mud flow and then we had them rate the effectiveness of their local government's disaster risk reduction initiatives so for example we had them list down the number of drrm programs and initiatives that they know and then uh, we did the exact same test after and compared the results so uh, we found out that in the pilot areas that actively participated in the Balangay project, like this one, uh, this one is in all of Taitnegaspi, we saw an increase in the test scores, in the knowledge, and the ratings of, uh, for their local government significantly increased even um, their participation in DRRM uh, projects. And then, interestingly, the number of families that are prepared before a typhoon or a natural calamity significantly increased. So from 18% from to 54%. Uh, 54%. Now, um, I'll just note that before launching this publicly, we ensured network security and user friendliness by conducting uh, extensive beta testing. So this is a beta test te uh, session which uh, you can see mostly composed of youth testers, but we also have government office representatives. And in parallel, of course, uh, when introducing a tool, we conducted youth-targeted information campaigns. 
So we positioned Balangay Network as a tool that's perfect for the local youth to use as their disaster information resource. And of course, the city of Ligaspi and Layer Tech, we conducted a three-session hands-on admin console training for all 70 communities in the city so that they will know how to use the admin console. And currently, this is uh, where the data is being monitored and uh, kept and closely studied. So here is a general schematic of the Balangay network. You know, just to give you a, a general idea. So we have here a cloud database which can be updated in real time by the admin console for authorized users only. But the information can easily be accessible using the web application or the uh, mobile application here. Now, uh, because of our, as a result of our uh, extensive research, we focus on four main features which we believe will be, uh, be of most help to, the, to these uh, communities. So first, announcements. Now, uh, rest assured that uh, the information that you get is legit and from authorized sources. Uh, I remember when I was in high school uh, here in Legaspi, I experienced firsthand a false alarm, a tsunami scare. You know, someone just like shouted tsunami tsunami and we all panicked and my parents they're all senior citizens they almost had a heart attack we were so scared and i was living in a relatively higher place but all my neighbors were evacuating because some of them don't even know what the tsunami is so but there's no tsunami but it caused tragic you know it caused accidents and it's pretty traumatic so if we can uh, be assured that the information will come from official sources, then there's uh, no need for, uh, for that to happen. The next hazard maps. Our provincial government uh, has, has very, very nice hazard maps. So we digitized it and we put some icons here and we put it on Balangay so the tourists, so that the people will know uh, where the dangerous places are and if they are given the directive to evacuate they will follow they know why and they know where and we also have the learning section so we found out that you know many uh, respondents cannot really correctly answer what disaster terms mean and these disaster terms uh, often appear in official advisory so that's a problem so we created a de-learning encyclopedia. This is sourced from different offices and sectors learning materials in the city and the province, but we translated it in the local languages and we presented it as simple as possible. And finally, we have emergency hotlines. So the, uh, through the admin console, our partner institutions can easily update contact information by themselves. Now, uh, some features, additional features that we added uh, we focused on the user interface. So it's actually designed by Miss Angie Tu of a very nice design studio based on the map preferences, user preferences that we got, got. And we have this no internet, no problem cache system because in areas with no internet connections, they can still use Balangay, majority of its features even without internet. And uh, we also have Facebook integration. So it is interesting because we have, you know, in rural areas, they don't have internet access, but they can uh, access Facebook free data. Uh, the idea is if someone would uh, share Balangay and they see it on their feed, like an announcement, even though they can't directly access the app, they can rest assured that it's from uh, legitimate uh, sources. Of course, we have a capture, data capture and analytics system is actually built for scaling. That's why we're, uh, we, it's pen tested for security conscious and big data ready. Now for those with no mobile phones, they can access uh, the Balangay app web app in this link. So yes, uh, here in the Philippines, we have many internet shops. So they can go there and like uh, just go to this and use Balangay as they needed it. And this is the web admin console. So we have authorized partners, representatives, which uh, they can log into the admin console and they can do this. So uh, they can post announcements based on their categories. And uh, yes, they can even manage their own offices hotlines. And then they can contact tech support. 
And recently, we added a damage reporting feature. This is a product of the feedback uh, system that we made. So in the first year that we implemented Malangay, we noticed that there's uh, over an over overwhelming request for a uh, damage reporting feature, so we added it. And finally, so uh, Balangay is really built with scaling as a goal. So currently, we are trying to scale out little by little to other cities and municipalities in the Philippines. And also, within the city, we're trying to find more network members, uh, CSOs, the academy, so that they can upload and share learning materials as well. And on our part as developers, we are working on establishing a best practice sharing link between different cities, Liga specifically in other cities, so that they can collaborate and grow by themselves with minimal support from our side. So uh, that's it. If you want a more detailed video uh, demo, we have it in on YouTube on this link. And that's it. So if you want to know more about Malangay, please feel free to contact me or Legacy City. Thank you. Thank you, Frey, for this uh, amazing presentation. Uh, actually, uh, we have also some questions for you from the audience, uh, but we will keep them uh, for the question and answer time later. So since uh, the time is uh, short, uh, we have to go uh, from Philippines uh, to Canada to talk about the project, uh, project which, which, uh, which received the first special mention of the jury of the Best Climate Practice Awards. Uh, the project Amphibious Housing, uh, uh, a building method promoted by the Canadian Boyan Foundation project and applied uh, in the Vietnam Mekong Delta, a region uh, experiencing increasingly unpredictable and destructive flooding. Uh, Elizabeth English, uh, the founder, uh, she's the founder and director of the Boyan Foundation and uh, she's in line uh, with us uh, from Waterloo, Canada. Um, in this video, we are going to know more about the amphibious housing project, which was given a special mention uh, of the jury because of uh, its innovative application of technologies to enhance resilience in flood-prone areas.
This is an affordable practical solution for uh, homes in urban communities all over the world. It's not the right solution for every type of house or every type of flooding condition, but where it is appropriate, it's fantastic and it's much, much less expensive than any of the other alternatives because as a retrofit, it continues to use the existing gravity load bearing foundation. And what kind of response do you have from uh, the UN agencies or other agencies where you, know, you can take this idea along with countries such as the one that, that we're in now? I mean, have you had a good response? Um, I have a great response at conferences. Where I don't have such a great response is um, with the US Federal Emergency Management Agency. Because understandably, they're apprehensive of developers getting a hold of this uh, uh, technology and using it to move new communities into floodplains. But I'm not building new communities. I'm supporting the resilience of existing communities. And these are people who've been living in a place for hundreds of years, in, in some cases, even longer for indigenous people, and they shouldn't be forced to leave. It's really as a solution, as a way of preserving uh, all communities in a traditional setting. Absolutely, and it's a great solution for a lot of the um, historic preservation issues. Where do you hope this idea will end up? Well, I'm now funded for a pilot project in Vietnam. And so we're going to be building two prototypes this year and perhaps as many as a dozen more next year before we assess the results and then I hope get a, uh, another grant from the same agency to scale it up and spread it across Vietnam and I hope other similar flood situations across Southeast Asia. But the reality is this is sort of a boutique solution that certain housing problems with, not by any means of sort of mass solution that could be part of It depends. In the villages in Vietnam, it can be a mass solution because the houses are the appropriate type of construction and the flooding has the appropriate characteristics. So what we're hoping is that we can teach the villagers how to do it. It's really a very, very simple system. They just don't know about it, and they don't know how to do it. But if we give them some examples and teach them how to do it, they can do it themselves. Not from the UN, I'd love to. Uh, right now, the consortium that is funding the Vietnam Project is um, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation, USAID, and uh, Zurich Insurance. And so, a very, very powerful, and I'm very, very lucky to have gotten this grant.
I'm hoping very, very soon that I'll be able to confirm um, a grant from the Canadian NRC for a project that will build amphibious retrofits for First Nations communities that are subject to flooding from climate change. And from the monitoring of the results of this, uh, write a set of guidelines for the development of building codes. And we're anticipating that Canada will be the first country in the world to have a building code that includes amphibious construction. Which is about the amphibious uh, housing on the rise. Sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so after uh, this uh, detailed video presentation, uh, we should have uh, uh, Elizabeth English uh, in line uh, through audio with us. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, are you still connected? Because uh, there was uh, some uh, connection problems. Uh, um, I'm still here. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. So Elizabeth, uh, thank you very much for being here with us. Uh, do you want to add further details uh, to the video presentation or do you prefer to keep some time for further discussing the amphibious housing project during the question and uh, answer time? I'll be happy to answer questions. Okay, great. So, uh, let's move over uh, and finally arriving in uh, Pune, India, uh, with the... Um, uh, we, where the watershed organization uh, development, uh, the watershed organization trust, uh, developed the project uh, water stewardship for water and food security in semi-arid regions. Uh, the project uh, has been uh, granted uh, um, <coughs> uh, a, a second special mention of the jury for uh, its uh, behavioral approach uh, addressing social inclusiveness. Uh, and uh, uh, for its capacity to increase uh, active engagement of communities uh, living in water scarce uh, region. Uh, Eshwar Kale um, is the coordinator of the water stewardship project. Uh, and uh, um, so hello Eshwar, uh, and thank you very much for sharing your project with, with us. Uh, we are going to uh, to see this video, uh, Ashwar, ca can you hear us? Yes, Aurora, I can hear you. Uh, okay, great. 
Okay, let's, the... so let's launch the video and then uh, you can add further detail, details about the water stewardship uh, approach uh, and structure. Uh, in the mean, uh, before this, uh, uh, Elisa Cagliari want to say hello to everyone because uh, she's actually busy at the um, COP23. Uh, so please, Elisa, go ahead. Yes. Okay, uh, sorry. Yeah, uh, I, I'm really sorry. I need to run because time at the COP can be very, very hectic. So we are all busy with a number of uh, events and projects. Uh, but I really wanted to thank you again as a member of the jury for the opportunity to review your projects. I really enjoy them and I really just wanted to congratulate uh, you again for the for the inspiration you provided to all of us and, and wishing all the best and I'm so sorry not to be able to watch uh, your video I swear but let me just say that uh, I, I truly appreciated your your project for this kind of uh, attention to involve uh, local communities and also tackle the behavior of uh, issue let's say uh, of the problem the behavior root of the problem so with this, thank you again. I don't want to steal any more time from you. And I hope to still keep in contact with you all. And bye-bye. Thank you very Ciao. much. Thank you again. Thank you. OK, so uh, now we launch the video about the um, water stewardship project. Uh, and uh, soon after, we'll talk with Ashwar Kale from Watershed Organization Trust. Oh, they have watershed organization trust. I will talk about what is the global resume organization dedicated to task of the value of millions across India and parts towards development, ecosystem restoration, adaptive sustainable agriculture, integrated and efficient water management, and most importantly, climate change adaptation. India has more than 18% of world's population, whereas it has only 4% of world's renewable water resources and 2.4% of world's land area. At the same time, at present, India is the largest groundwater user in the world. Therefore, water resource in India is under severe threat. During water spread of more than 20 years, we learned that only including the output of water of people in dry regions is not a long term solution. Unless we enable communities to use available water, the sustainable and judicious. Along with this, in rain dependent dryland of India, increasing electric rainfall and return droughts are related to trusting for the agricultural production. I am to cope with this climate and non climate and losses. Necessary to include they in the model and use to take informed decisions at the farm, enterprises, and community level to enhance their resilience and the adaptive action. For addressing this situation, it is necessary that communities and students understand the responsibility of responsible planning and, most importantly, act accordingly. In efforts in this direction to find pathways to improve the level of water governance and grassroots level. Our organization, WPR, in collaboration with Hindustan Cultural Foundation, has launched the Water Stewardship Initiative in October 2015. This initiative brings science, policy, and governance together to find breakthrough on how we the different water challenges. The Water Stewardship Initiative is being implemented under six regions across two Indian states, Maharashtra and Karina. Both of which are largely semi arid, regularly impacted by drought, and very dependent on groundwater for drinking and electrical needs. The overall goal of this initiative is to promote responsive water management that is socially equitable, 
Okay, thank you. So Asher uh, is here with us uh, and uh, after this uh, uh, interesting uh, video introduction, 
uh, we can uh, follow through by adding some uh, details uh, on the uh, water uh, water stewardship project that uh, your organization, uh, Watershed Organization Trust, uh, developed uh, in uh, several areas we have seen in India. So please, uh, Ashwar, uh, the floor is yours for uh, uh, three to five minutes to uh, add some details on this project. Okay, thank you, Aurora, and hello, everybody. Uh, the overall goal of Water Stewardship Initiative is to build dialogue and capacities of village communities where they understand their responsibilities to harvest and use water in appropriate manner. This is very important in changing climatic situation to make different water users and most importantly farmer communities capable to adapt with the changing adverse weather condition. Uh, water stewardship is applied as the major strategy in this initiative where expected outcome of this process is that communities use water in a sustainable, judicious and efficient manner. To achieve this outcome, the water stewardship approach is based on few important assumptions. Here water has been understood as the common pool resource rather than private property and it requires collaborative efforts of all stakeholders to manage it in appropriate manner. This initiative is based an, on important assumption that treats different water users as the important stakeholders and water managers rather than the passive beneficiaries. To achieve this, there are necessary conditions to create positive and encouraging environment where the water users should feel ownership of local water resource. Along with this, to govern this resource, institutions need to be inclusive, influential, and capable to prepare and execute village level rules and norms for appropriate water use. To create such positive environment, stakeholder engagement is adopted as the key strategy in this initiative where different water users come at one forum to discuss, debate and plan for appropriate water use. Scientific information and knowledge get shared with these uh, stakeholders to take informed decision. These engagements get organized in a manner where through games, group exercises, and different activities, behavioral aspect of different stakeholders get addressed. Water stewardship plan is provided as an important tool uh, to plan supply as well as demand side water of management. Thus, stewardship approach form the basis for this initiative. Uh, Aurora, next please. So the, these are the uh, few, uh, the impacts we have achieved, I will not spend much time on this, but there are more than 60 stakeholder engagement we have conducted with different stakeholders where government officials and different categories of farmers and the stakeholders have attended and uh, discussed many things. Aurora, next please. As an initial step, as I discussed earlier, water stewardship plan is the important tool to promote appropriate water use. As an initial step to create water stewardship plan, communities assess the water problem and understand different water challenges they face. And to address this situation, they prepare village water budget, which help them to understand whether they have adequate amount of water to, for their different water needs or they will face water deficit. As an action plan of water budgeting, they prepare water harvesting plan and water saving plan to reduce this deficit and make required rules and regulation to execute these plans. Next please. So the water budgeting is an important tool to match the water availability to different water demands. This process at initial step calculate water, overall water available in the village and then on basis of and then basic water for drinking and other necessary uses get deducted from it. In remaining water, villagers have to plan their crops. Thus, this plan gives them opportunity to replan, to reschedule their crops as per the available water. In this initiative, the capacities of VSRT, that is the village stakeholder representative team, and gel sevaks have been built where they independently prepare and execute this water budgeting plan. Uh, next, please. So the farmers are experience, experiencing crop advisories 
which is given to them through mobile sms based on local weather conditions as a very immense useful tool this help them to take necessary actions to protect their crops and increase their production by appropriate water use and the cultivating practices thus we see this initiative as important for the replication in the dry arid and semi arid regions which have the potential to change the whole drought context and the adaptive measures uh, at then i thank the organizer the iccg for giving this opportunity to us to share this project with all of you thank you thank you very much to you ashwar uh, coordinator of water stewardship project in india uh, and uh, we are now at the question and answer time uh, since uh, we have uh, some time constraints uh, we will have uh, time just for a couple of selected questions for uh, each project uh, so uh, since uh, we already are talking with Ashwar Kale from uh, the water stewardship project in India uh, I would like to <coughs> to ask you uh, Ashwar uh, how the project uh, involves uh, the communities and people. I mean, uh, there is an impressive uh, uh, spread and structure of this project across so many villages uh, and area in India. Uh, is your organization selecting the areas uh, and the local authorities uh, uh, proposing uh, and proposing them to be involved in the project or it works uh, the upside down uh, with local authorities uh, directly contacting you to implement uh, the program okay a good question aurora the, the thing is that we are there are few drought prone areas in the maharashtra where the, the recurrent drought is there actually and the context of the wtr is that wtr has implemented many good watershed projects but after even implementation of good, good watershed projects after a long gap then the whole race of this water explo exploitation start. So we are facing this problem that supply side interventions are done, but because of the institutions, the lack of institutions and the, the lack of demand side measures, we are not able to, to address the situation. So we have taken these projects where the supply side water management has been done, but because of due to this demand side measures and lack of good institution governance, there is a uh, scarcity and the problem of water. So uh, we have selected villages where the watershed project has been done, but the governance has been not appropriate place. At the same time, there is a history of the recurrent droughts at the different times. Yes, Aurora. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, uh, thank you very much, Ashwara. Uh, I'm, uh, we are receiving uh, some uh, question, uh, and actually the following question is uh, uh, for uh, uh, Elizabeth English. So we have a question from Venice, actually, the, the city where uh, we are uh, right now, a city that do have problem uh, with the high tides, uh, recurrent high tides and increasing sea level rise. Uh, the attendees uh, say uh, that uh, try to imagine whether the amphibious housing pro approach may work uh, in Venice, uh, but uh, it's hardly to see this amphibious retrofit uh, as a feasible approach uh, uh, in this peculiar urban state space. Uh, so I would like to ask you what are the best house structure and context uh, feature that uh, apply to the amphibious uh, to apply the amphibious housing concept? What are the best area and uh, the building structure that uh, really works with this approach? Um, well, let me first say that I have actually uh, looked at the question of amphibiating Venice. Um, I think it would be possible, but on a very, very much larger civil engineering scale than the scale I am working now. Um, for the time being, we're getting started, and so we're looking for small homes or small buildings mostly constructed of wood or bamboo or lightweight materials 
Uh, it's easiest at this point if the structure has a crawl space underneath where we can put the buoyancy elements uh, and then it also needs vertical guidance uh, posts inserted in the ground either inside the building or outside the building depending on the circumstances and it's a very simple process uh, but we also look for flood characteristics where the flood comes with mostly rising water rather than fast flowing water or waves. Okay, so thank you. It's very interesting uh, to know that uh, theoretically this uh, retrofit uh, may apply also in uh, such a peculiar area as Venice. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so now uh, a question for Frey Sanjil, uh, actually a couple of questions. Uh, Frey, thank you very much for uh, being with us uh, all this time and uh, following uh, the, this uh, round table. Uh, there is a, a question uh, from uh, the audience that say Balangai is a wonder, wonderful disaster risk reduction effort. Uh, how it is resilience enhancing? Uh, actually, here in, for example, in Legazpi, we have uh, many resilience projects. Like, how are we supposed to rebuild? You know, how are we supposed to rebuild our uh, our houses after a typhoon, where to go, when to go back to uh, to your houses, re uh, relief operations. We have many projects like that. But the problem that Balangay is addressing is how how to um, make these uh, init already existing initiatives uh, work better by because uh, some somehow you know there there have been cases where there's miscoordination between the people and the implementing organizations the government like oh you're not uh you know uh you're not being fair distributing goods you know stuff like that and many more so by actually focusing on learning on making them understand the actual initiatives how to be resilient you know, we're, we're more on the preparedness side, we're focusing on that. So when the time comes that that uh, action is needed, chances are, because they understand the project, the, uh, why the implementers are doing that, the information gap is bridged. So the tendency is that they will uh, work better with uh, with these organizations so they can be better, uh, they can be more resilient in a sense. Um, did I answer your question? <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, yes, uh, exactly. Uh, we have uh, another question for you uh, that is um, that actually uh, uh, concern uh, the challenges uh, in uh, scaling up uh, and uh, replicate the project. Basically, they ask uh, if it's possible, the, if you think it's possible, or, or if you are trying to replicate the project in other uh, areas uh, or cities. Yes, actually we are uh, trying to replicate this, but we are taking uh, little steps because the context upon which Balangay was designed is uh, based on a Philippine city, provincial city. So as much as possible, we want to replicate this little by little within the Philippines first. However, uh, just recently, like a few months ago, I have been receiving uh, proposals or uh, invitations to replicate it overseas. But before that, I think we will have to repeat what we did in the pilot area. So the pre-intervention assessment, post-intervention assessment, Okay, uh, thank you very much, Frey. Uh, we are uh, really uh, running late, uh, and so we have to basically conclude uh, this uh, question and answer time. Uh, we reached the end of uh, this amazing journey across the strategies and uh, approaches to build up uh, climate resilience for uh, vulnerable communities. Uh, I thank you very much, uh, uh, all of these, the great panelists that we had uh, at the, during this uh, stimulating roundtable today. Uh, uh, we apologize for uh, some uh, technical inconvenience we had, but uh, I mean, it's the beauty of uh, the live uh, broadcasting. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, I thank you a lot to all the participants that follow the discussion on the Votu webinar. And uh, I, invite you, I invite you to explore all the projects that participated in this year's contest uh, on the bestclimatepractice.org platform. Uh, the registration of this uh, event, of the online roundtable, uh, including uh, all the um, materials, uh, will be soon be, uh, be available on the ICCG YouTube channels. Uh, I also remind you that uh, ICCG is covering uh, the climate talks uh, in Bonn, uh, COP23, um, so uh, monitoring uh, also the um, climate resilience and adaptation issues. So if you want to keep up uh, with the ongoing uh, negotiation in Bonn, uh, you can visit the ICCG website that directs you to the full coverage uh, of the um, COP23. Uh, for uh, any question, uh, any further question, uh, do not hesitate to write us. Uh, you will find uh, all the contact details uh, on the Best Climate Practice website uh, and the ICCG website. Uh, again, uh, Ashwar, uh, uh, Kale from India, Frais and Jill uh, from the Philippines, and uh, Elizabeth English from Canada. I really thank you very much for uh, your uh, great efforts, uh, your, the great project that you shared with us, uh, and the time uh, that, you, that you take, uh, that you took in um, joining this uh, event. Thank you very much again, and uh, goodbye. Goodbye.